Okay. So let's let's take a look at this next section. Again, we're not going to get all the way through this today. We'll finish this up on Monday. Um, but we should be able to enough. I mean, get enough of a feel that you can work on parts of uh, three point five over the weekend. So this section involves some a little bit of trigonometry. So I want to go back and I want to take a look at a, a few problems um, like we've got here and remind you of how inverse trig functions work. So inverse trig functions, we plug in a ratio and it tells us what angle they correspond to. But remember, the range for an inverse trig function. Um, is not you know all the different angles like for sine inverse it's uh, negative pi halves to pi halves it's anything in the fourth or the first quadrant um, so if we if we're trying to find the sine inverse of one half we're going to get an answer here um, and there are a couple of different ways that we can do this one of the easiest ways to do a problem like this is to actually draw a picture this literally represents a ratio of two sides on a triangle we know we've got to be in quadrant one or quadrant four to line up with the range for sine inverse. And because this is positive, remember, the sine is the y coordinate on the unit circle, if you want to think of it that way. Or even if we thought of this as the opposite and this is the hypotenuse, this has got to be one. Let's make that look a little bit better. This has got to be one and this has got to be two. And then you could use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what this side is, or you could recognize that if this is a right triangle and the, I've got a leg that's exactly half the size of the hypotenuse, this is a special right triangle. This right here would be radical 3, which would make this the short leg. That makes this right here the small angle, so that makes this 30 degrees, or we normally do this in radians, so that would be pi 6. So the answer to this is pi 6. Okay? So that's how inverse trig functions work. We plug in a ratio and it spits out an angle. So if we take a look at this composite uh, right here, this is the cosine of the sine inverse of x. This right here is an inverse trig function. So this must be a ratio. So let's make it look like a ratio. What's going to come out of this is an angle. So we're going to be taking the cosine of an angle. So when we're done with this, the answer to this is some ratio based on whatever we get out of this inverse sine function. Okay, Remember doing these? Okay, if, if you took trig at the community college, I guarantee you did this very problem. Okay, And if you didn't take it here, if you took trig somewhere else, you did something almost exactly like this. Okay, So let's take a look at what the picture would look like. Okay, again, we're just focusing right in here, just on the sine inverse of x over 1. Again, we've got to think of that as a ratio. So let's draw a generic triangle for that. The opposite side would be x, and the hypotenuse would be 1, because remember, it's the opposite over the hypotenuse. And then we'd use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what this one is. Okay, so if I used, I'll use a b for this one, so we'd have b squared plus x squared equals 1 squared. So if I moved the x squared to the other side, it would be subtracting x squared. Then I'd take the square root to get b all by itself. So I'd have a square root of 1 minus x squared here. Okay. Does this all ring a bell? Seen stuff like this before? Okay. So this right here represents the situation in this sine inverse of x. Okay. You don't know what that ratio is. You don't know what x is. But you do know that this triangle would represent that angle that, that we've got right here. Okay? So what we want from this is we want the cosine ratio for this guy right here. Well, cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So on this particular one, it's going to be radical 1 minus x squared on the top and 1 on the bottom. Or the answer to this is just 1 minus x squared underneath the radical. Any questions? Okay. All right. Well, we'll see what that has to do a little bit later on. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to maybe at least one of those today. Maybe not. Uh, if not, you can let that cook in your brain over the weekend, and we'll pick up where we left off. Okay. So this section in 3.5, we deal with something called implicit differentiation. Implicit differentiation or implied differentiation, if you wanted to think of it that way. Most of the time, we're given functions or uh, expressions 
that state what the relationship is between x and y explicitly. So y is a function of x. Like these examples right here, y equals 2x squared plus 4. Y is explicitly written as a function of x. We've got a y on one side, and all of the x's are on the other side. Same thing here, y equals sine of x. Okay, y equals the ln of x. Anything like that, any of the functions that we typically deal with are normally y written as a function of x. Okay? But we can also have an implied relationship between the two of those, and we call that implicitly defined. So something like this, x squared plus y squared equals 25. Okay, y is not on one side all by itself. They're kind of mixed together. Same thing with this one right here. This one looks kind of ugly. We've got an x squared, we've got a y cubed, and we've got an x times y term. Okay, so when, we, when those are mixed together, we call that an implicitly defined function. And sometimes you can separate it and make it implicitly defined. Most, or sorry, explicitly defined. Most of the time you can't. Okay, so here's the point of this. Regardless of whether there's an explicitly defined relationship or an implicitly defined relationship, there's a relationship between x and y. If you plug in an x, you can get out a y, or if you plug in a y, you can get out an x, uh, things like that. If there's a relationship, then you can graph that relationship. And if you can graph it, there have got to be some slopes that you can find. Okay? Or in other words, we've got to be able to find some derivatives. Okay. So, this first example right here, it says, given this equation, which you've seen before, okay, start working with those in Math 1010 and in Algebra 2 and that sort of thing. So, just a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 5. That is an implicitly defined relationship between x and y. It says, find the equation of the tangent line at 4, 3. So we're at 4, 3. We're at this point right here, and we want to find the tangent line. Well, in order to come up with the equation of the tangent line, you've got to have a point, which we have, and you've got to have a slope, which we don't have. Which means we've got to take this right here, and we've got to find the derivative. Now, on that particular one, yeah. Sorry, did you have, did you have Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep, we could do that. Very clever. So you, Juan's using some geometry. So if we want to find this tangent line here, Juan's thinking this. Well, let's have let's figure out what the line is that goes straight sort toward the center. Okay, tangents are always perpendicular to a radius. Let's figure out the slope of the, that uh, radius, and then we can figure out the slope of the tangent. Any calculus involved there? No. Nope. Very clever. You think we're going to be able to do that on every one of them? Nope. Okay, that would be a geometry or a pre-calculus approach. There's another pre-calculus approach that I mentioned down here a little bit later on. So let's, let's just cover it right now since we're trying this using pre-calculus. Could I take this and could I solve it for y? I could. I could get y equals the square root of 25 minus x squared. Again, notice that I've got the positive because I want the top half of the circle. And then could I find the derivative of this? Could I find dy dx now? What would I need to use? I'd need to use the chain rule. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll do that uh, that way in just a second. But what I want to show you is I want to show you something called implicit differentiation. We're going to get the same answer as if we used a couple of these pre-calculus techniques. And really, this is pre-calculus to get to here, and then we'd still have to use derivative rule, chain rule, and stuff like that to get there. So that would be a, a decent approach. But the problem with both of those pre-calculus ideas is you're not going to be able to do that every time. It's not something that you could rely on. Okay? And all we'd have to do is add one simple term to that expression, and those two techniques are out the window. Okay? So we're going to do something called implicit differentiation. Okay, and we can find the derivative of an implicitly defined function using the chain rule. And this is why we do implicit differentiation right after we cover the chain rule. And the way we do this is we treat every variable as a, a differentiable function of x, including y. We treat that as a differentiable function of x. Okay, so here are the steps that we typically go through. Differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to x, treating y as a differentiable function of x. We just differentiate everything with respect to x. Applying all the rules that we've learned, quotient rule, chain rule, product rule, and all that sort of stuff. 
collect terms with dy dx on one side of the equation. Okay, I'm going to use the differential notation. I'm not going to use y prime. If you want to use y prime, you can. If you look in a solution manual, sometimes they do. Believe me, I have, I have people every year that try this. For some reason, writing it that way, especially when you start doing these, you tend to make more mistakes. That y prime doesn't jump out as much, and if you write it like I tend to do, sometimes you'll mistake it for a y to the first power instead of a y prime, and then you're really in trouble. Okay? So I like using that differential notation dy dx, and then all we do is we just solve for dy dx. So let me show you how to do this problem right here. I'm going to differentiate this term right here with respect to x, and I'm going to think of everything in terms of the chain rule. So the outside function is the squaring function. So I'm going to find the derivative of the outside, leave the inside alone, and then I'm going to find the derivative of x with respect to x. Now I'm going to write that here for just a little bit, but what is the derivative of x with respect to x? It's 1. Now, the reason I'm going to write this is so there's some, going to be some uniformity, and you can see how we're treating everything the same. This is the same outside function, so this is going to be 2 times whatever that was to the first. That's a y. And then I'm going to find the derivative of y with respect to x. So that's going to be dy dx equals, what's on the other side? A constant. So that derivative is 0. Now, if I write this the way any normal human being would, here's what they'd write. 2x, 2y, dy, dx equals 0. Okay? That's the equation that we get from this original equation when we differentiate both sides with respect to x. Everybody okay with that? So I've differentiated both sides with respect to x. I'm going to collect the dy, dx's on one side. So that means I just need to move the 2x to the other side. So here's what I've got coming up here. I've got 2y dy dx equals negative 2x. And then I want to get the dy dx by itself. Just like always, I want to have the derivative on one side, either a y prime, a dy dx, an f prime, whatever it happens to be. So I can read off, hey, here's the little formula that will tell me what the slope is. And to do that, I'm going to divide both sides by 2y. So here's what I've got. I've got dy dx is equal to, I'm going to cancel the 2's, negative x over y. So that's our first implicit derivative, and we want to take note of a couple of things. This is the first time where we found a derivative where the derivative, in other words, the slope of the curve, depends not only on x, but also on what y is. You have to have them both so you can plug them in and figure out what the slope is. So if you take a look at this particular problem, can you see why that's the case? Can you see why we need both x and y in order to figure out the slope of the tangent? Anybody? Why do you need x and y? Why not just x? You could potentially have different slopes. Okay, the hint is right there. How many points are there that have an x-coordinate of 4? 2. There's one up here, and there's one down here. And they have drastically different tangent lines. One's sloping up from left to right. One's got a positive slope, and the other one's got a negative slope. Okay? So we need both of them. Okay? Because there are two points that we could potentially have with the same x-coordinate. Okay? Everybody good there? Usually, usually we use implicitly defined, uh, or we'll, we'll use implicit differentiation to find slopes of curves that are not necessarily functions. So we could have some weird graphs that are going all over the place, and we can find their slopes even though they're not functions. Okay, okay it's kind of like our first tiptoe into multivariable calculus. Okay. This is still single variable calculus, though. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's come back up here and let's finish this. If we now know that dy dx is negative x over y, let's evaluate this at the point. The point was 4, 3. So this means our slope is we'd have a negative 4 over 3. And I'm going to write this in point slope form, if that's okay. y minus 3 
negative four thirds. We we do expect a negative slope, right? Okay. And then x minus four. Okay. So there is point slope form. And then just for the heck of it, so we can entertain Juan a little bit. Okay. Let's find the slope of this radius right here. We would run four and we would rise three. So that would be three fourths. So the slope of the radius is three fourths. If I want something that's perpendicular to a slope of three fourths, opposite reciprocal, negative four over three, there we go. So good confirmation geometrically for what we just found using calculus. Pretty awesome, huh? Okay. Um, if you wanted to find the derivative here, and this is what I was talking about down below, okay, is there a way to find this without using implicit differentiation? Yeah, you could write it like this, and then let's find the derivative this way. So this would be dy dx equals 1 over 2 times the square root times the derivative of whatever we were taking the square root of. Derivative of 25 minus x squared. What's the derivative of that? Negative 2x. So is it okay if I just erase the 1, put a negative 2x, cancel these, negative x over radical 25 minus x squared. And I'm not going to finish this, but let's just point out a couple of kind of interesting things. Okay, what if you plug in a 4? You get a negative 4 over 3, don't you? Okay. So more confirmation there. We got the right derivative. Also, take a look at what's on this page right here, right in this area right here. Could I change square root of 25 minus x squared for something else? And if so, what is it? I can change it for y. Wherever there's a square root of 25 minus x squared, I can put a y. Put a y in the denominator, and we're right back here. See how all of this stuff matches perfectly? Okay. Any questions? So, do you think you could use either one of those pre-calculus ideas all the time? No. Okay. It would only work on very simple functions. Okay. It certainly would not work on this ugly mess right here. Okay. There's no way you're going to get y all by itself. So for something like this, you have to use implicit differentiation. And when you take the test, when is that, in a week, or, week and a half or so? Um, when you take the test, you're going to see problems like this. You have to know how to do implicit differentiation. So here's how we do this. Again, the first step is differentiate both sides with respect to x, treating every variable as a differentiable function of x. So this right here is not very hard to do. It's just like normal differentiation. Again, for a little bit, I'm going to show that we're differentiating everything the same way. So this is going to be 6x squared. The inside function is x, so I'm going to multiply it by the derivative of x with respect to x. Again, a silly thing to write in this case, but I'm trying to show you the uniformity of this technique. I'm done with the first one. What about this one right here? What rule do I have to use there? I, I, I always have to think about the chain rule, but this is a product. This is the first one, and this is the second one. So we're going to do the first times the derivative of the second. That's going to be 2y dy dx plus the second y squared times the derivative of the first. What's the derivative of x with respect to x? It's a 1, and I'm going to write this. Notice how I'm treating everything as a differentiable function of x. I'm going to come back here and turn these into 1's in a minute, but do you see how we're treating everything the same way? Minus 2y dy dx equals over here, a 0. And you'll notice that the only term on here that doesn't have a dy or dx or something okay, is this one right here because it's a constant. And the derivative of a constant with respect to any variable is always going to be 0. Any questions there? Okay, so let's clean this up just a little bit. Here's how we'd normally write it, 6x squared. We're going to write this as 2xy dy dx plus y squared dy dx minus 2y. Oops. That's, sorry about that. Okay, that's just a 1, right? That's a 1 and that's a 1. Okay, and then minus 2y dy dx. 
Any questions? Okay. I'm, I'm just showing how we're treating everything the same here. And then I cleaned it up just slightly. Honestly, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be writing dx dx a whole bunch here. I'm usually just gonna go right to this line right here. Any questions? Okay. From here on out, the calculus is done. All we're doing is just some algebra. We're gonna get the terms with dy dx on one side. We're gonna collect those. We're gonna move everything else to the other side. Then we're gonna solve for dy dx. So this term and this term don't have a dy dx, so I'm going to move that to the other side. So I'm going to have a minus 6x squared minus y squared. These two terms do have a dy dx, okay? And I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to write each one of the, well, let's see. Since they both have a dy, well, no, let's, let's make sure everybody's clear here. Uh, because that was the second times the derivative of the first, and the first is a d is an x, so dx dx is just a one. All right. Okay. And then this is two y dy dx. Now, how do I make it look like there's only one dy dx on this side? Factor it out. So if I take out the dy dx. I'm left with a 2xy minus 2y, and this other side is negative 6x squared minus y squared. And how do I finally get the dy dx on one side by itself? Just divide both sides, okay? So dy dx in this case is, can everybody watch please? You're probably not gonna find this in the back of the book. This is probably what you're gonna find. 6x squared plus y squared, and then you're going to find 2y minus 2xy. What happened? Yeah, factored out a negative either out of the top or the bottom, okay? Changed the sign of everything, Top multiplied the top by negative 1 and the bottom by negative 1. It's just an equivalent fraction, okay? So there's our answer. Any questions? Okay, let's run through this again. So this is 2 times something raised to the third, right? So this is a power function. So I'm going to multiply that by 2. So bring the exponent down, okay? Leave the inside alone, but raise it to the second power. And then times it by the derivative of whatever was on the inside. The inside is an x, so that's a dx dx, which is a 1. That's why I don't write it again, okay? Then this is the first 1 times the derivative of the second. The first is x. This is 2 times something raised to the first times the derivative of the inside. The inside is y, so the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. Okay? And then I've got the second, y squared, times the derivative of the first with respect to x. Derivative of x with the okay? But, does that make sense? I wrote, I wrote dx dx uh, once or twice. Okay? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're carrying out the chain rule on every single one of these. It's just that if we're differentiating with respect to x, dx dx is a 1, so we don't normally write it. Okay. Here I wrote it just so you could see the uniformity. We are treating everything exactly the same. We're treating everything as a differentiable function of x. Okay. Does that work? Okay. So let's take a look at this problem and we'll see if we can do anything more than this one. So this one is an implicitly defined function of y is x, but if you wanted to think of it as an explicitly defined function, x is explicitly a function of y. Okay, but to get this type of answer, we're going to need to do some implicit differentiation. We're going to need to think of this as a composite function. Let's differentiate this side with respect to x. What is the derivative of x with respect to x? dx dx or 1. Outside function is sine. Let's not complicate things. We know how to find the derivative of sine. Derivative of sine is cosine. Leave the inside alone times by the derivative of the inside. We are differentiating everything with respect to x. So the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. And I don't have the option of just not writing that because it's not a 1 like it was on the other side. Make sense? Okay. And then we just solve for 
dy dx. On this one, it's easy. dy dx is 1 over the cosine of y. Now, that's perfectly good, but what we normally do is we say, you know what, maybe I could tweak this just a little bit. Maybe I could change this. We're a little more comfortable plugging in x's than we are y's. x is normally our independent variable, so let's see what we could do with this. Okay? Could I find a way, like we did on that problem up above with the square root 25, 25 minus x squared, could I find a way to replace y with its equivalent? Maddie, what do I do? Okay, except for you, you can't divide by sign. Sign doesn't mean anything. That would be like dividing by a radical sign without anything in it. Okay, but right idea. We kind of want to undo something. What do we want to do here, Juan? We're going to take the arc sign or the sine inverse of both sides. So if I were to take the sine inverse of both sides, I'd have y on this side and I'd have sine inverse of x on this side, right? Okay, now let's plug that in. So now we get dy dx is equal to 1 over the cosine of, what am I plugging in for y? Sine inverse of x. Did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, it, it, it has a vertical asymptote. Well, let's see. No, it doesn't have a vertical asymptote. Um, it, it comes to a point where we have a vertical tangent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're thinking of the sine inverse function. Yeah. Okay, it does have a vertical tangent. Okay, and we're going to see where that is in just a second. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, because we can uh, make this in implicit y equals sine of x, mm -hmm. can you uh, use the calculus and use that to find the y dx? So, use this to find it? Yeah. Yeah, you could, but do you know how to differentiate yeah. sine inverse? Well, my, my question is this. So, in order to clean that up, we would have to, uh, we'd have to use the calculus of the original, right? Uh, we would have to make the, you could, you could, the original equation first. No, no, we're going to clean it up right now. Okay, look at the top of the page. Does that look familiar? Look at the starter question. What is the cosine of sine inverse of x? That's it. Okay, now is there any place where this doesn't exist? And this is what uh, Juan was pointing to. Yeah, it does have a vertical tangent. Okay, if you think of what sine inverse looks like, uh, let's see, sine inverse looks like this. Its domain is from negative 1 to 1, and its range is from negative pi halves to pi halves. Oops, positive pi halves. So you plug in ratios between negative 1 and positive 1, and it will give you angles um, between here and here. Um, but we've got a vertical tangent here, and we've got a vertical tangent here at... Lo and behold, where does this not exist? At 1 and negative 1. Okay. Okay. So this is the derivative in terms of y. You plug in a y, it'll tell you what the slope is. This is the derivative in terms of x. You plug in an x, and it'll tell you what the slope is. Okay? All right. Any questions there? Okay. Um, let's take a look at the other side, and let's do, let's do one more problem. And then we'll pick up here on Monday. You've got enough information that you could do quite a few problems on the assignment. Okay, But let's go ahead and do this problem right here. So this one says we've got y minus x equals e to the x times y. So definitely an implicitly defined function. There's no way you're going to get y on one side completely by itself. So we want to find the derivative of y with respect to x, dy dx minus the derivative of x with respect to x, 1, and then the derivative of this exponential. So that's going to be that same exponential times the ln of the base, but I won't write that because ln of e is 1, right? Okay, and then times the derivative of whatever we were plugging into the exponential. What did we plug into the exponential? 
x, y. x times y. How do you differentiate x times y? Product. So we're going to do first here and second here. So this is going to be the first times the derivative of the second. x times the derivative of y with respect to x. Plus the second, just write it down, it's a y, times the derivative of x with respect to x. And what is the derivative of x with respect to x? It's dx dx or just a 1. Okay? Okay. And now we're back to algebra. Now we need to collect the dy dx's. So this would be dy dx minus 1. This would be x e to the xy dy dx plus y e to the xy. I'm going to move this. Yeah, did I make a mistake? No, because remember, that's only if this only if one of those is a constant. Okay. So we're using the chain rule. The derivative, so the derivative of e to the u is e to the u du dx. So I rewrote e to the u, e to this function right here, and then I'm timesing it by the derivative of that function. That function happens to be a product, so I use the product rule. Excellent question. These take a while to get used to. you got to practice these. Right there. I just distributed oh. through. All I did is distribute. Good? Okay. I'm going to move this ugly mess over on the left side, and I'm going to move the one over on the right side. So this is going to give me dy dx minus x e to the x y dy dx equals, this would be y e to the x y plus 1. All algebra. How do I make it look like there's only one dy dx? Factor it out. So I get dy dx, I get 1 minus x e to the x y equals y e to the x y plus 1. And how can I get it all by itself? Just divide. So I get y e to the x y plus 1 over 1 minus x e to the x y. And again, notice that the slope, the derivative, Depends on both x and y. You have to plug in an x and a y in order to figure out what the slope of the curve was. Okay? Any questions? Nope. Nope. You could try it. There aren't, there aren't, there aren't any common factors there. Okay? All right. Um, let's stop right there, and we'll have the quiz.